And introducing today's speaker is the president of Daniel Morgan Academy, Ambassador Joe Santatroni. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Terry. Good morning. Thank you for being here. This is a very special presentation, very special day for us. Terry Roberts is a personal friend and a colleague of many years, and we're so fortunate in having it here. And you know, this subject of expectation of privacy in the digital age, this is really timely, isn't it, given what we see in the newspapers? <laughs> about ensuring that you know, your emails are secure and, and <laughs> watching everything and so forth, so it's great. Uh, let me just say, uh, Terry Roberts, the former Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence, and I know we sent out a little bio on, on Terry, but let me just read a little because I think it's, it's important to understand the unique background of this uh, lady with us this morning, a very, very distinguished speaker this morning. Terry Roberts is the founder and president of Whitehawk Incorporated. She's establishing the first cybersecurity e-commerce sharing community, enabling all businesses, especially mid-sized and small companies, to have continuous and online access to tailored learning, very appropriate here for uh, the school, mm -hmm. and smart buying and connections to the best products, services, insights, and trends industry-wide. Previously, Terry was the task vice president for cyber engineering and an analytics running all cyber IT, financial business analytics, cross-cutting innovative technical services. Prior to TASC, Terry was the executive director of the Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute, leading the technical body of work for the entire US interagency, with a special focus on leveraging and transitioning commercial innovation and acquisition excellence to government programs and capabilities in establishing the engine emerging Technology Center and Cyber Intelligence Consortium. You've always been on the cutting edge of things, Terry. And certainly in this area, you have and you continue to be on the cutting edge. Let me just say uh, a little more going just a bit further back. Before transiting, transitioning to industry in 2009, Terry Roberts was the Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence. Um, I did some work with you when you had that job, Terry. You did a great job there. And I might add, she was the lady for the Office of Naval Intelligence who was looking at cyber with, uh, with a laser focus. And, and I, I commend you, and you, you just had the foresight of seeing it down the road. But here we go with the Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence, where she led, together with the Director of Naval Intelligence, more than 20,000 intelligence and information warfare military and civilian professionals and managed more than 5 billion in resources, technologies, and programs globally, leading the initial approach for the merging of naval communications and intelligence under the OPNAV N2 slash N6, I'm sorry, I will have to get a definition on that one, and the creation of the Information Dominance Core. I mean, that's, that's creative, that's, that's pushing, that's cutting edge. Outstanding. Prior to being the Navy DDNI, Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence, Terry Roberts served as the Director of Requirements and Resources for the Office of Under Secretary of Defense, spearheading the creation and implementation of the Military Intelligence Program in partnership with the Director of Naval uh, of De National Intelligence, of National Intelligence, the services, the combat support agencies in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, Terry Roberts has been an intelligence professional for over 30 years. You, know, you said you were going to be brief. And this is where I'm going to be. <laughs> this, is the, this is it. This is always important. Terry is the co chair of the Intelligence and National Security Alliance, Cyber Council, and for Task Force Efforts, a member of AFSEA Intelligence Committee uh, on Naval Intelligence Professionals and, and the Board of Directors, and participated in the Cyber Education Advisory Board for the U.S. Naval, uh, Naval Academy and Marymount University. Many awards. Please read her bio. It goes on because it's rich and it's relevant. And we're so fortunate to have you here today. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm exhausted already. <laughs> so I want to keep this uh, <clears throat> very seminar-like. So if anybody wants to chime in at any time, uh, please do. 
this is a particular um, speech that I am iterating on. And as you can imagine, every day I'm learning new things. So I am also looking for inputs. Okay. Uh, I come at uh, privacy and national security uh, issues from a little bit different perspective than folks might think. Um, so under my personal privacy hat, I'm actually really in the box. You know, I don't, don't, don't throw stones at me, but I don't do Facebook, I don't do LinkedIn, um, and I'm a little paranoid about it because my personal privacy is very, very important to me. Of course, my, you know, my grown kids are like, hey, you're in our Facebook or you're in our thing, so you're actually out there whether you want to be or not. Um, and obviously, on the professional side, right, I've been out there for a long time. So they're, you know, right, your pro professional side, yes, it's, it's all out there. Um, and as I go to the next phase of my company, you know, I actually have to have people who are going to manage the company, right, online, face, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, whole, all of that, okay? But personally, I don't, I, and I never share photos except within a family group share. I never have pictures of young children. I actually have a whole spiel that I give on social media security to executives and middle managers. Um, so call me really in the box on the privacy side, okay? On the national security side, obviously, um, I know about the authorities that the national security community has. Um, I know about the oversight regarding those authorities. And I believe that we need to have a continuous discussion about those and, and have it out openly in a discussion. But I want law enforcement, um, an intelligence community, Department of Defense, Homeland Security to have the ability to protect us, okay? So a lot of people talk about privacy and national security and it's a balance. I don't think it's a balance at all. I, I don't think you can walk a balance line. And so what I'd like to do is sort of walk you through sort of a, a logic train of events so that we can frame the discussion. And then I'd like to go into some, uh, and I'm not a lawyer, some of the current <coughs> statute and precedents that we're operating under. And then I'd like to kind of throw caution to the wind and say, let's try to deep dive into some specific areas because the overall sense I want you to get from this discussion is we've been talking about privacy and national security up here and that's not helpful. You know, saying, I want my privacy, okay, and saying we've got to have a strong, you know, national security capability, okay, that's great. But those two things juxtaposed at a really high level isn't bringing us down to a level of how do we work this day in, day out in specific circumstances. And what is realistic today? Because we're living in a very different world than I lived in as a little girl, okay? Dramatically different. Okay, so let's start out with some of the things, but I'm going to frame them according to this discussion. So some of the recent cases, right, we started, the first time we really lost at scale personal health <laughs> profiles, right, was the anthem breach. Think of what you have <laughs> in your health records, okay, gone. With the Sony breach, it was really more about intellectual property, right? Their unreleased movies. Um, and then executive commu level communications. Um, but the one that really sort of, you know, when you think of, of uh, sort of letting the cat out of the bag from, from the industry side was the Panama Papers where you know you think of law firms and what and the trust a law firm right has with a client whether you appreciate who was outed or not 
Um, those are some of the most, right, private business discussions. You can have mergers and acquisitions, uh, business secrets, <coughs> financial secrets, the whole thing. On the national security side, we haven't done any better. <laughs> so starting with WikiLeaks, right, and private manning, and then moving on to, and, and by the way, it was the scale of that, right? The scale was unimaginable and literally online. Um, and then, of course, with Edward Snowden and, and the files that were stolen from NSA. I mean, again, the magnitude. It's still not over. Okay. The OPM breach, a personal loss for myself three times over. So my background investigation from Navy, from National Reconnaissance Office, and from DHS. Fingerprints, everything, gone. And gone, right, to uh, the Chinese who want to use those against us. And then, of course, there's the recent, fairly recent case of Apple and, and the FBI. Very different twist, right? More on, you know, how do we, what, what is the appropriate partnership um, across commercial industry and government when it comes to a national security issue? So what are some of the common threads across all of these things? Is that the precedents <laughs> that we're currently relying on for a lot of these circumstances are from the 19th and 20th century. There's very little that's been created of impact in this space in this century, okay? So I think it's one in particular is pretty illustrative of the privacy issue because it's important to understand how we in the US define, right, right to privacy. And it's actually from Katz versus the United States in 1967. And I actually, I actually like the way that it defines us in this space. So reasonable expectation of privacy is an element of privacy law that determines in which places and in which activities a person has a legal right to privacy. So right, I may value my privacy, but I really only have a right to privacy in certain circumstances, okay? And and so we have to, right, it, there's, of course, um, three aspects of this definition, reasonable expectation of privacy. One, that the individual had a subjective expectation of privacy. So I, as the individual, have to believe that I have the right to privacy in that communication or in that interaction or in that discussion, right? Two, that subjective expectation of privacy is one that society is prepared to recognize as reasonable. So it's not just that I expect it, it's that you all, right, say, yes, I agree with her. That, that makes sense. And if either element is missing, you don't have it, okay? I actually think it's a, it's a very reasonable approach, right? Um, but since we want to stop debating this at a really high level, let's get down into some of the eaches, and this is where you get to get involved, okay? Because I think the bottom line is is that we need to establish a reasonable expectation of privacy in the digital age. And so one of the exemplars that I give is if we think about in the olden days, where, um, and actually some of us remember this, where you had a switchboard operator, either in a government you know, headquarters or in a big company, and all the calls came into the switchboard operator, okay? So the switchboard operator knew who was calling, okay, and who they want to get connected to, and often they heard, you know, the beginning or ending of the conversation kind of thing. So, while you had an expectation of privacy, there was a third party involved in every one of your discussions, 
And so maybe it wasn't at the height it was before. And if you take it to another analogy, which is a party line, okay, where two or three families literally shared the same phone line and they could pick up on your call, right, at any moment, you, you, you even start, right, you start going down on whether those conversations, it reminds me of mail, right, on the outside of a, of a, of a letter, you have a two, right? You know who it's going to, you know who it's from, you know the, the date stamp on it. Um, you have the externals, right, of that communication. So, so let's ask you, your work emails. This is on company or government IT. Do you have an expectation of privacy? How many people think you have an expectation of privacy? Raise your hand. Okay, you are correct. Someone owns your infrastructure. If your employer owns that infrastructure, phones, devices, laptops, whatever, they own all the communications that are on that. Okay. But no one else. But no one else. But no one else. Good point. Good point. Um, social media postings. How many of you have an expectation of privacy because you have established relationships with certain people? So I'm saying within your circle that you've established those connections, do you have an expectation of privacy that it will remain within that circle? Expectation or belief, no one's like that. <laughs> There's a difference. <laughs> but even an expectation. Your friends can share. Yes. Right. So yes. your friends can share. Yes. You pretty much. You're, you're in trouble. <laughs> okay. Just searching and shopping online. You know, you're just you're just browsing da 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 da, da online. Any expectation of privacy regarding that? No, we all know, right? We get the advertisements back because they've been tracking our cookies and they know all the sites that we've gone to, they know the purchases we've made, they have a profile of us, right? Okay. Uh, blogging, and it's a no-brainer, right? You're, you're sharing out there on purpose. Okay, personal cell phone conversations where you own the device. Expectation of privacy. Okay, not everybody though. <laughs> Okay. Expectation or belief. So. Hope. <laughs> or hope. So this is, it, it, it is, it's, I'm going back to the legal definition, which is a reasonable expectation of privacy. So in other words, in the digital age, do we have a reasonable expectation of privacy that all of us think, we think we have it, and the group, society as a whole would think that we have it? I would agree with that, but I don't believe it. Okay. We have an expectation of privacy, but if anybody thinks their okay. phones aren't happening, so, okay. so part of the reason why I think we want to define this better in the eaches is because then we want to put the right statute in place, the right technologies in place, right, the right protocols in place to actually have that level of privacy for personal calls on our phones. Because by not, right, very carefully defining this in the eaches, then we don't, we, we're not moving to the belief stage, right? So in other words, it's, the, it's sort of the old saying, if you're not protecting, if you're protecting everything, you're protecting nothing, okay? If our expectation is that, hey, you know, uh, I have a right to privacy, um, but we're not doing anything about that in the eaches, then we really, then we really don't have it. So that's kind of where I think we are, is that we're fighting so much for it that we don't have it almost anywhere. Um, communications that impact a potential crime or terrorist act. So in other words, that letter, right, that communication from you went to a known terrorist. This is, this is the, right, the FISA law, okay? 
where you're just looking at the externals of the communication, you're not looking at the content of the communication, and you're looking for those connections, okay, to bad people, to known bad people. Um, and so, again, then with a court order, right, that brings up probable cause, and then with a court order, you would be able to look at the content, okay? Um, legal financial or fi legal or financial transactions. So with your CPA, with your attorney, um, do you have an expectation of privacy? And I would say yes. Okay. Personal medical information, right? Personal consult with your doctor, right? Even though we've had a lot of breaches. Um, so if you drill into this. It's because we really haven't set up consistently the technologies that allow us to put those files in an encrypted um, level of access and then link it to a member number, right, or a name, right. We really haven't consistently come up with what are some of the real rules and protocols and basic approaches that you could put in place to protect medical information and not treat all information, right, the same way. Um, legal, uh, we've already done that. Okay, let's move on. So we really need to stop trying to protect everything online, okay? It's impossible. <clears throat> um, we, we really can't, right, with any kind of certainty do it because I think most of us who work in the field today know that they're already in, right? Low-level crime and fraud actors, if you have no protections in place, right, either on, at your home infrastructure or in your office infrastructure, if you don't have cybersecurity protocols in place, if you have old software, an old operating system, then low-level criminals can come in, okay? If you have some level of cybersecurity programs in place, then, then it takes a more sophisticated actor to get in. But if you are a lucrative target, like a bank, right, or a law firm, where, they can, where it's worth them, right, having some level of capability to get in, then the assumption that a lot of us are making today is they're already in. So then it becomes, what do you really need to protect, right? And the analogy I like to use is your home, okay? If, if right now, if you have an old operating system, your doors and windows are open, and your jewels and bonds are in your underwear drawer, okay? If you have, you know, up-to-date software and regular patching, and you have employee training, you, you automatically, right? bring it, it's amazing. You get rid of a lot of the low level access. And, and why am I talking about this? Because it has a lot to do with privacy, <laughs> right? If, if you really treasure some of this personal financial information, um, if you treasure you know, what you're working on, if you treasure you know, what you're sharing uh, and developing at work, okay? If you have an expectation of privacy because, right, for all the reasons we discuss, um, then that is going to make a difference. I want to watch but there's a level talk. above that, too. Please. <clears throat> which is a sophisticated state actor can do almost anything they want. It, I, I'll tell you, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. Most people can't break into certain encryption. So if you have your crown jewels, so let's just say you're a company with intellectual property and that really is the source of your, di your company's difference, right? Um, and, you, and it's encrypted and there's only 
you know, a small handful of folks who have access to it and maybe you have derivatives, right, that you use on a day in, day out basis, then they might be able to get into your email, right, but they won't get into your IP. So it's really about, you know, what is it that you're trying to protect? Where do you have that expectation? And then put those protocols in place. Put those technologies in place. Put the policies in your company or business. That's a more optimistic government. view than some people. <laughs> Remember, we're talking the masses. Yes, sir. I was going to say that um, even with the best technology, isn't the real problem in this day and age uh, social engineering? You know, being able to flip somebody from the inside, to bribe somebody, to get an in with a trusted source, and it's more difficult to establish protocols about that. And I was yes. interested to hear what you had to say about that as far as establishing. So, so I think I think, um, and I was one of the people that worked um, in and around Jonathan Pollard. Okay. Um, I was one of the people that noticed weird behavior, okay? There were several of us. And so if you have the right training in place, the right online tracking of who has access, who doesn't have access, again, what, what, what my stretch goal is always that I'm trying to get rid of the, the 80%. Right? We're trying to go from the Wild West <laughs> to, you know, at least the 1940s, okay? Um, and right now we're still in the Wild West. So if, if you know, yes, there are still high-end hackers that will go in for high-end targets. Um, I do believe we didn't have any of the right protocols in place for, with, at OPM. You know, so we, didn't, we made it so easy. <laughs> Um, that it was a no-brainer for them. Not only that, it was a legal target from an espionage standpoint. So, so what I would say is, if you re if you put a program in place, and one of my girlfriends started the Insider Threat Center at Carnegie Mellon University 12 years ago, um, and they have you know the thousand plus cases in government and industry, they've been able to model the behaviors. They can tell you how to very easily put a, a program in place and, and with not a lot of money, you know, like the top five things to track that are basically just business process things. Like when someone is about to get fired, right? Mm -hmm. You let the security people know, you take them off, <laughs> right? They no longer have access before they're told, you know, little things like that can actually make a huge difference. So are we talking about we're going to get rid of everything? No. No. Are we talking about that we can get rid of literally 80 or 90 percent? I think we can. I think we actually can if we all buy in. And again, if we stop trying to protect everything, if we, if we stop having in our brains that everything that we do online is not exposed and is, and is private, and then we try to protect all of that. We, we start going into that sort of death spiral. Um, so we, we've actually gone through those points. OK, so national security versus privacy. Um, again, let's, let's go back to the, the Apple example. Um, the intelligence community has Title 50 authorities, OK? In espionage, collection, other things. Um, and there is, for those of us who have been on the Hill a lot, a regular and extreme oversight to include intelligence oversight. Even when I was a junior officer, I would have to go through an, an intelligence oversight inspection every year. Okay, um, And you cannot Def, you know, detect, find, and disrupt the bad guys without these capabilities, right? Because they have no rules. So we need rules of law. We need lines in the sand. But we need those to be realistic in the fact that if we know, with my previous example, that, that a bad guy is communicating with an 
unknown entity potential, you know, seen as good guy, that that whoever they're communicating with, right, means we need to look further. Do we want to know who bad guys, known bad guys, are communicating with? Do we want to know that? And if we do, then it's about having, and I think we've had a lot of the right frameworks. I'm not saying the frameworks don't need to be tweaked, because as you know, a part of this aspect too is that this whole arena is moving at the speed of technology, right? So something that we may, I, it drives me nuts when we see policies or statute that are technology centric as opposed to functional centric, right? If a, if, okay, I'll pick on OMB for the heck of it. They have a policy about um, multi-factor authentication and fourth factor authentication and, and I'm kind of like, why are you drilling down into as opposed to saying, you know, state of the art and that will be released in a in a in an annual update, right? Vice, the interagency wide policy that everybody is getting. Because then you just you just can't keep up with what's going on. Okay, so law enforcement has authorities under the U.S. Code to include showing probable cause for a warrant, regular oversight, court system checks and balances. But currently, their authorities are based on the Federal Wiretap Act of 1968. Okay, let's think, let's think about that. Then there's the Electronic Communications Privacy Act of 1986. Um, so the first one to address interception of oral and wired communications, and the second one to extend coverage to the response to the need of regulating interception of computer, and they actually say, and other digital and electronic communications. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to go into, into all of the details of that particular statute. It has been updated twice. Um, and oh, by the way, very rarely are these taken to court. And that's a, a little bit of my bottom line. We, we have old statute. We have a desire to maintain privacy in critical areas. So let's, let's define what those areas are. And I think through your nods, we're already there, right? We want our medical information to remain private. We want our financial and legal transactions to remain private. We want phone calls, right, on our devices or emails on our infrastructure to remain private unless there's probable cause, right, for a reason to delve into the content. But we don't have expectation of privacy. I may have missed one or two. Anywhere else because it's not reasonable in the digital age. It's not supportable. You can't, in other words, can society as a whole look at those instances and say, yeah, we can, we can deliver privacy in that area. So I'd like someone to tell me about the Apple versus FBI scenario. Can someone tell me, with this as a backdrop, what what do you think? What what could have been the right approach, please? Well, um, I think for that it would be, have been more useful to look at the precedent with hard copy. So if I wrote a letter and sent it to you, uh, the FBI couldn't just decide that it felt like opening it and reading it. It would have to perhaps issue a warrant to go through a legal procedure to do that. But there would be nothing once they did that to prevent them from opening the letter. It wouldn't be rigged to explode. It wouldn't, right. you know, self-destruct. And there would be a, there would be a parallel. So I understand how Apple to market 
right. um, is protecting its customers' privacy because it thinks that's what they want. And I understand how maybe the FBI shouldn't routinely be able to just delve into your cell phone because it feels like it. But when they come armed with a warrant and say, I right. need to look at Tom's cell phone, right. how can it be? Right. And they did have probable cause because it was a go. known terrorist and cell phone. Going. How can it be designed so that they can't, so they can't, well there you go. How can it be designed physically that you can't do that? Right. And by the way, I want some millennials ch chiming in here. <laughs> <laughs> Just, sir. I'll, I'll be middle. <laughs> it's, uh, they weren't asking just to see it. They were asking Apple to create a new product that once it's out there, it's out there. Not a single person, I personally don't trust my iPhone anyway because it's made in China. But <laughs> you're asking somebody to break your own business. I, so I, so I'm surprised. I got to chime in one thing. I'm surprised that any producer would not have the anecdote. Is that the right antidote? Antidote um, for anything that they create, and I, and so that's the question I pose in general. In other words, if you create, you know, a, a bacteria for you know fighting certain things then, you know, I want you to create at the same time, right? Because in my worst case scenario, and by the way, I don't pretend to understand the answer for this, is that if we know, what if it's a preemptive thing? So what if there's information on a device about an upcoming major terrorist or catastrophic event and what 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 are we supposed to do at the national security level in other words what are the you know protections that we want to put in place so that when it's not after the fact it's before the fact and we just say can't can't get into the device, so I guess we're not going to get the information. And so I guess you know you could argue that's a those, danger to national security, right? Young people. <laughs> oh, I think because they went through the right process, they should have had at least tried to open up the phone because at that point it is national security because it's a terrorist. Apple, you mean? Apple, yeah, yes. Apple. They're the person communicating with a terrorist organization or a terrorist. And at that point, that's the difference between maybe saving a thousand lives or saving a dead person's privacy. And that I think. Honestly, and it, it's actually not just so you know. I, I like your thought. It's not about the dead person's privacy. It was about um, creating the fix, right, to that cryptology, which meant that it was potentially going to get out to others, which then impacts the security of everybody else's phone. But your first part, I yeah. agree with total. I think they also, because yeah. I know you can, um, OTA is called over the air, like mm -hmm. um, updates, like you could definitely update your security codes even after, right. like you could create something that could get into that specific phone, then update everyone else's phone and then exactly. it's safe. Or you could recall even though that's okay. hard it's still national security yes sir uh, I was, so yeah, was going to add to that because that does seem to be the misunderstanding in the older generation that they weren't just asking, asking for access to this particular phone yeah apple had created an encryption infrastructure that was common to all iphones yes. that created a double blind situation where apple can't get into it if the user cannot get into it correct and what it, to give a better example it would be like um the FBI, all right, let's imagine that an apartment complex is the United States. It would have been like uh, if they had asked the apartment complex not for a key to this individual's apartment that has illegal material, but that they were asking the, uh, the owner of the complex to create a master key mm -hmm. that could get into every single apartment in the apartment complex. Right. and that they promise that they're going to keep it safe. But right. as we've discussed right. and as we've seen, even at right. the highest level, right. there right. are such deep security compromises that creating yeah. a fix, you know, a, a, you know, this once you create this product that can undo the encryption, it's out there. And if it gets that into someone's hands, we're not just right. looking at one terrorist attack, we're right. looking at potentially 
a hundred more security compromises that could lead to further violence. And so I agree with Jeffrey here that the fix is that you do have to create an over-the-air update of some sort, deploy a technology that can unlock a particular phone and then update everyone else's update phone it. at the same okay. time. Right. So let me play devil's advocate. There's some of us who believe that there will always be, right, we've been chasing in the warfare arena, and I can t consider terrorism warfare. In the warfare arena, the next technology, the next technology, the next technology forever, right? We come up with GPS, we get GPS jammers, right? Um, we, you know, we come up with, uh, uh, what was the? Uh, satellites. In satellites, and we have anti-satellite missiles. So in other words, this is how it goes. It never ends. So devil's advocate is, yes, we were, you know, by, by the fact of what the FBI was asking and what actually ended up happening, right, it was breaking that particular um, security approach. It was going to be broken eventually, and frankly, the fact that, you know, we an did. Israeli company could do it was kind of like a no-brainer. In other words, hard, never impossible, but time, right? If we go back to my other example of we're trying to prevent something from happening, which is really what we're normally trying to do, okay? I mean, the reason you investigate that past terrorist act is because you're hoping to find connections to other terrorists who are already planning things so that you can prevent act from happening. It's not just, you know, to hold dead people accountable. Um, so, so in other words, we're in this technology race forever. So this is a, you know, this is a moment in time kind of thing. But I want to hear other thoughts or other thoughts in general. We can go any direction. Yes, ma'am. You, that is a great insight. So, okay, why did FBI go public? Why didn't they just, you know, is, is there a point to be made by going public? I mean, the more transparent, you know, transparent they are, the better right. they look like to the public. Right, right. But you see what I'm saying? It could have accomplished that thing of, hey, for a national security issue, we're just going to work this with you. Does everybody else really have to know? Yes, sir. The government overreached because they didn't want a master key to the building. They did want a master key to the building, but they didn't even need a key to the office. What they needed was the information, right. which they could have asked Microsoft or. Oh, that's a very Apple that's for, a very good point. And say, give me the information because in a civil suit context, okay. DOJ, for example, when chasing uh, copyright infringement. Uh, by the way, Hollywood enjoys DOJ as its law enforcement in a civil suit context, thank you, Congress. Um, when DOJ chases on behalf of a civil claim by Warner Brothers, some infringement because uh, you are duplicating movies or whatnot, mm -hmm. they don't say, I need to get into every email on planet Earth to look no. at them all. They say, I no. need the information, and Verizon, you must give me this. Uh. And Verizon does. And Apple could have. And if you let Apple go ahead and break their own machine, 
right. and then surrender the information, you're uh -huh. fine. But what, what happened was the intelligence structures wanted the ability to break the machine right. uh -huh. and obfuscated the need for information with a need to do this bad thing. And, then and I think it, it is a bad thing. And yeah. that's, and that's I think that's a, a really brilliant point. Yes, I sir. I think there's a double side to that also. Yes. Um, because um, who's saying, since Apple is a private company, who's to say they would give you all the information anyway? And how it's can the true. government trust that? Right. Like just coming from Apple themselves who obviously... And by the way, yeah. I'm in business for business. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the whole reason, right? They yeah, exist. Exactly. And they're an important international business. Exactly. Um, and so that does come first. Yeah. I, I'll go one last comment, but then I'd kind of like to go in another direction unless someone has something amazing to say. I <laughs> mentioned it, and he's mentioned it. I, I was on the bill, and there's a huge lack of trust of government right now. And this is all following Edward Snowden. Right. And when I was up there, um, former member was up there, all you would see were government employees keep doing bad things and keep having their jobs. And it's it starts with something minor, but it's gotten up to the national security level to where when mm -hmm. the, go the feds say, yes. give me something, yes. and so, everybody so, says, so let's I don't drill trust the a government. little bit into the Snowden thing, okay? For, for those of us who have been involved in, in FOIA um, and FISA, uh, and, and please feel free to chime in, I, I don't understand why we didn't, meaning the national security community, why we didn't have a better story out there all the time about how it really, how the process really worked. Because my sense across the atmosphere is that people actually believe that NSA was look, had the authority to look at anybody's emails, the content, any time. And what they were doing was looking at the metadata, remember the outside of the envelope, to look for those connections. And to me, that's a no-brainer that you want them looking for those connections, and you want a court system to look at the details. So how did we how did we blow that? Very really quick, quick. Very, very quickly. And then uh, I think it was last year or the year before the data that was available, 100% of the requests for warrant were granted. Uh, where there's no oversight. And so metadata is the data in the envelope. All I have to do is ask for it. I will get it. Okay. And so I'm not collecting metadata. I'm collecting information on everybody. Okay. Because I have plenary access to it. Yes, sir. Well, I was going to say, I don't understand. I haven't heard the journalists or, or maybe the government. I don't know who should say it, but Snowden is also, and the people that say, um, they're not accurate. I don't want to call them liars and hypocrites, but they're not accurate that it's only about the privacy of Americans because he leaked, he obtained, and then leaked information about U.S. intelligence collection on foreign terrorists who are yes. not American yes. citizens, not in the yes. United States, who have no rights under U.S. law, no right to any civil liberties under our Constitution. Why did he include that? He didn't that discriminate debt? Why to did make he his point. That? So it is not about, strictly speaking, privacy of Americans, because he included these other people, and they, they don't. They don't. If, if you're in Sweden and you're a terrorist or wherever you are, you're outside the United States and you're not an American citizen, I'm yeah. sorry. It's yeah. not just about civil liberties of yep. Americans. And no one wants to say that. Yes, sir. Um, so with the explanation of the American public about what metadata is, for someone who's never heard of the term, which I'm sure was a right. majority prior to certain right. Which is why metadata. I use the envelope if analogy. You just think about it, you know, in terms of uh, the etymology of it, it sounds like you're saying all of your data. Yes. People don't understand the metadata is a small portion. That's actually, metadata that's actually like a really a good point. More. And then when you try to explain, oh, no, it's not a lot, well, I don't right. trust you because my initial, right. you know, the prediction error I have is that it seems like it's a lot. So to try to pull someone away from that initial anchor is very difficult. If yes. a different term had been used in metadata, perhaps you may have shifted the debate, but again, you know, for the majority who aren't in the tech, okay. you know, uh, when you say metadata, then you have to really parse it out, they're not paying attention anymore because it's an emotional issue, it's not a rational issue. Okay. 
Um, if you forgive me, I, I really want to go in a completely different direction, and then we can circle back. So I want to go to the social media privacy kind of side of the house, but looking at it as at, from the intelligence professional side that I am. So there was a case, and I forget the family's name, but my um, girlfriend, who has a cyber detective agency and is a PhD in psychology, um, did a did a profile, and I think I can I can send it to you guys. She has some really great reports. Um, and it was the D.C. area family um, who were tortured and killed, the uh, CEO of the company, wife, son, and uh, nanny. And as they unraveled it, it was the result of what they found in social media on, on the family. And then, and then following that, right, the ability to then take them hostage extort a, a level of money and and then ended up murdering them is there an understanding of how much you know the body of information that is out there on families and individuals and companies <laughs> um, you know is there an understanding fully of if someone is bad and they have just basic skill sets how much they can learn about you, and yet we're arguing about privacy on, on the other side. You know, we know when you're on vacation, we know who you're traveling with, we know when your house is empty, we know who your circle of friends are, we know who your professional associates are. Um, I mean, you know, from my intelligence collection hat, it's like, gosh, this is, you know, literally a no-brainer. On, on what we can gather on you. So what do we do, you know, what do we do about this? What the do we do? The young man who murdered the Savopolis was yes. a former employee. Yes. So he was already privileged at a level of information right. that right. the average but person But he was able to get near term, yeah. right, there, there activities and sure movements. Yes, yes, yes sir. I'll also add like some social media sites, they have like privacy things where you can block people that aren't following or something like that from seeing, which I don't think is really that private unless someone, like it's probably a low level hacker could get into that, yes. but still that's still a barrier. It, that no, it raises the bar. I actually, yeah. I think that's a really good point, you know, just putting an access protocol in place, right? You just make it a little bit difficult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is outward facing, right? Making that a little softer for your LinkedIn profile, right? That can be a little softer. If they want more information, they can come to you. Um, and also, you know, anything that you're showing about family members or friends or the one I get most scared about, children. Um, you know, a lot of the, the targeting of children has been through other folks, sites and things. Are there any concerns um, or any ideas of how to address this or turn this around? Or is it not a, a concern? It's a concern. It's just how do you fix it? You either don't use the sites at all, <laughs> which most people who have any kind of an intelligence background are exactly the same. Yeah. Or because we think like bad guys. Yeah. Exactly. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, we know how to think like we know, bad guys. Yeah, exactly. We know how they're thinking. Yeah. Um, but how do you fix it? Other than not using it, which is rather impractical in this right. day and age. Yes. To say, well, I'm not going to put anything on right. any media. Right. Yes, ma'am. Um, so go back to the point that you made earlier. You can make a more selective decision about what type of social media information you share. So there are websites that are specifically devoted to updating family if you have a sick relative mm -hmm. and you don't want to clog up everyone's news feed with news about your sick grandma, you can go to a specific To site. the Caring Bridge or, right, right which I do think is a great approach. And there's specific wedding sites if you don't want to see a bunch of wedding pictures. And yes. Baby sites if you want to like pictures of babies all day. Right. And you can make the encryption around those websites much stronger right. and have a stronger expectation of encryption around right. children, around right. medical issues, right. not 
Facebook. So I, I really love that point, and that's kind of my message to the to the students or future students in the room is, um, we need you thinking this way, right? We don't want you to just think, well, this is the way the world is, and there's nothing we can do about it. We really want you to take control of the digital age and make it to serve you as opposed to oh, just having it, the bad guys, right, can reign. Um, and those of us who want to retain privacy and security, right, we, I think there's a lot we can do, but this is a we thing um, that we have to focus on and think about and that everything that we talk about, the enabling power of all of these capabilities, and there is amazing enabling power, right, has a flip side to it. And so as we're, as we're developing these approaches or advancing them to the next level, I think we have to take into account privacy and security as we implement them. It's not just about how cool they are. So, what am I forgetting? Yes, sir. Just a quick point about search engines also. You know, it's remarkable how much people are willing to share um, with the world that they think uh, that they shouldn't share with the government. Well, the government also has equal access to it. Um, just using Google, for example, was uh, cautioned against by my former employer when I worked for a tech company with the understanding that maybe Google would be reading all of our emails or translations or anything else. I don't think people think about it. There are some alternative search engines out there like DuckDuckGo that <laughs> right. don't actually trace you and you know that, yeah. that blocks uh, yeah. companies whose whole business model is you know basically marketing everybody in this room's profile to people so that they can sell to us. Mm -hmm. No, I think the, the flip side of um, remember, what, what has happened in the digital age is that then individuals have become very powerful and international companies have become very powerful on a level, right, of a state actor, right? We've seen that quite a few times now. Um, and so to be suspicious only of government um, as opposed to, right, we need to be looking at anyone who has an enormous amount of power, an enormous amount of capability, and who we have given them, right, freely, a lot of that power. Um, it is something that you can take back individually or as a company or as a family. Um, you're actually more in control than you think. Um, and then where we don't have the control, that's where I would love for us to um, come up with, with new ideas, new technologies, new policies um, that, that could take things to the next level so that we're equally empowered. How about disinformation? <laughs> uh, what kind of disinformation are you going to do? Just go to the wrong website. <laughs> oh, oh, you're going you're gonna to send them on a, on a wild well, goose chase. Yes, yeah, Evan. Um, well, that kind of touches on something I don't think we've uh, discussed at a great level is deterrence. How would you prevent somebody from engaging in an action because the cost of repercussions would be too great mm -hmm. if I even engage in it? So it's not even just, it's really, really hard to crack the system or we have really good protocols to protect ourselves, but how do we just make people like, doing this is not worth it at all at a, because you know, if you commit a crime, you get arrested. You know, that's, that's a very strong deterrent for a lot of people. If right. you attack a country, they go to war with you, you know. <laughs> it's, it, you know, the deterrence from that type of, you know, yes. standpoint is very, very powerful, but how does that translate into uh, the digital age? So I would love for us to solve the deterrence problem. Some of us have been discussing this for a long time, and we realize that traditional ways of thinking about deterrence don't necessarily work. <laughs> Um, and that in it, our ability, like right, we, we our ability to have attribution, um, like consistently and openly, that we can let it be known. Um, our ability to have warning. Uh, we we haven't progressed 
um, industri industry side cyber intelligence to the level that it could be that we could get to warning, okay, right? Because warning is the result of across my business sector or across other sectors, I know, and, and friends of mine who are really smart in this space say there's, you know, if you get rid of the low level crime and fraud, there's about between 100 and 120 campaigns, international campaigns of a level that, you know, they have actors, adversaries who are trained, who are knowledgeable, who have a game plan, who, you know, are executing that game plan, whether it's for money or whether it's espionage, okay? Then we can focus only on those campaigns. So an example is the, I hope we get the Cyber Threat Alliance, okay, is an information sharing partnership across a handful of big corporations, Palo Alto Networks, Intel, Fortinet, and you can look it up. Their CISOs and cyber intelligence teams are not only doing, and because they have large networks, right, global networks, are doing real-time sharing, right, across themselves, but then they're also going after a campaign. So they broke the ransomware 2.0, okay, together, because they, with pulling their data analytics and insights from their networks, they and their smart cyber intelligence teams together, then they were able to break that, which then sort of teed them up to be able to provide some kind of warning of the next version that could be the ransomware. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. Then you start getting to a level in there, and when you're going after campaigns and those kind of actors, you can actually start getting to attribution because they do have, right, behaviors. Um, they do have regular sites that they operate from. You can then go with an all source approach to actually, right, find out mm -hmm. where they are physically. And you can start bringing that together because then you would have the power to be able to say, I, I'm going to get you because you actually know who they are. What about offensive cyber? <clears throat> I'm sorry, yes, offensive cyber. So I'm all supportive of industry having active defense capabilities. And active defense like gets to the point of you don't destroy, but you potentially could get a better sense of attribution. So you can actually go outside your network, right, to gain some level of attribution. The problem is you have to be really good. So it's not the kind of thing that you want every company doing <laughs> because you really have to know what you're doing. And then you might want to, if they get enough, right, then you, you literally call in the big boys, right? And, and that's where the private-public partnership, I think, is really important. But having those kind of relationships, and I will say, I'll give FBI a lot of credit. FBI actually has an amazing reputation from a um, cyber response, digital forensics investigations standpoint, and a level of trust with industry that we may, you know, as the young lady brought up earlier, we may not have in other areas, right? But in the, you know, response and investigations, um, and they have their local InfraGuard. So I always recommend to everybody who's who's in business that you have a relationship with your local InfraGuard. But it's I'm getting away from your whole thing. But the basic thing is. We got to raise the bar exponentially on cyber intelligence on the industry side. And by the way, those are great career fields. I'm placing people all the time. I mean, everybody wants people with intelligence, trade analytic, trade craft, and technical grounding to go into cyber intelligence, cyber threat intelligence in support of industry. So Terry, could you continue on that point? Because it really is a pretty holistic area to be looking at right now. Yes. And because uh, Evan, you talked about attribution. I mean, we saw the North Koreans because we saw attribution elements. Whether mm -hmm. it was the ISP where it was coming out of, and, mm -hmm. and some of the algorithms, some of the other indicators, and that has to be out there. So there's there's a science that's going on, and then you put it into the context of of who th these bad actors are, state actors. 
you can probably do it. Yes. It's a non-state act. The criminal groups, half a trillion dollars in, in, in crime, it's affecting all of us here. Yes. They're taking your, the major, they go into your bank accounts the, and so forth. The mafia forth. has. Exactly. Yes. This is a new way of doing business for criminal groups yes. and, and so forth. Yes. So this is really where you need smart people coming yes. at it. And when we talk about Apple and, and security, you would think, the, and these companies are great. You, you're the expert here at Silicon Valley and so forth. You would think that there would be a way of not from permitting anyone to get into it, not permitting a backdoor that could be used by criminal groups or others, but on a case-by-case -case basis. If necessary, you can get into it and, and, and so forth. So it's the element of creativity and pushing it forward. Are we, are we as creative as we should be in this area, Terry? You mentioned nuclear uh, when we had a meeting in my room a little while ago. You know, well, I like to feed you a bone every now and then. Well, no, no, seriously. <laughs> because when you go to the 70s and the 80s, we're sort of creating yes, as we're going forward. Yes, a lot of smart yes, people coming yes. into it. Are we doing okay. this with cider? Okay. No, because no. So, okay, really quick. This is the analogy I always give. Um, when, when nuclear materials were weaponized, right? And, in, in, and, I, and I realized there were events that occurred that, that uh, drove this. But basically, across the US, an entire ecosystem was developed. The national labs, all of the universities had uh, nuclear programs. Uh, the military services created entire career fields and training and education and safety and maintenance. And I mean, if we added it all up, holy smokes, you know, tens of hundreds of billions of dollars were spent. Policies were developed starting in the 1940s, the deterrence mechanisms, the indications of warning, the whole intelligence community, da 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 da, da. When, when software was weaponized in 1988, nothing happened. Okay? And for some reason, and I've talked to a lot of brilliant computer scientists, for some reason, the computer scientists who focus in the network world are often not writing things down. They are not building bodies of knowledge. So that's why key research universities like Stanford, like Georgia Tech, like Carnegie Mellon University are critical because we really, since that happened in 88, we should have an incredible body of research and knowledge that to build upon, and we don't in this space. And it, and it goes back to, I think we could have greater advancement in attribution. Do you see what I'm saying? It leads to almost everything that is going on. Um, and so my message to the young, brilliant people here is, this is an incredible field to, to get involved in, in any area that you like, whether it's cyber-related law, business, operations, cyber intelligence, national security. You know, we need your brilliant minds to be involved in this space because we're getting done to as opposed to making it happen. So thanks so much. I really appreciate your time.